through. Mm. Don't tell us all. Exactly. That's fine right. too, okay. sure. <laughs> uh, my name is Matt Wallace. I'm a uh, record producer. Um, work with a various, varied amount of our artists. I mean, you know, really eclectic uh, group of people, and uh, one of them was the replacement, so. And the other thing is that uh, just a verbal <coughs> release that you know you're being filmed for, telling you're obsessed, and you're fine with the footage being used. I'm fine. I know I, I am uh, very cognizant of the fact that I'm being filmed, uh, as evidenced by the camera and the red light, and uh, yes, I am assuming that you'll use it uh, wherever you possibly can. And okay, so cool. <coughs> All right. Um, I guess I'm going to start with that. Before, were you a fan of the band before you brought up, were brought up that project? Well, that's actually a uh, two-fold answer. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Okay. I was a big fan of their recorded work, uh, huge fan, starting with uh, the album Tim. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've seen, having seen them live a couple of times, one time in particular, I was just like, I, I actually left. It was so horrible. I, I'm, I'm assuming it was supposed to be falling down. Show. Yeah, it's, you know, they, they, I mean, they do that whole thing where they start off, they're playing the songs you really love, and you're like, yeah, I can't believe I'm seeing the replacements, and we're in this small venue. It's fantastic. And then they decide to start playing covers. And that's funny for a moment, and then they start playing snippets of covers, and then it's just uh, basically a, a train wreck. Mm -hmm. and How early so, was that? Uh, gosh, I want to say this was like, uh, my, I'm sure I'm going to get my dates wrong. I was probably like around 80-ish. I mean, I know I was going to college. I know I saw it at the Berkeley Square, mm -hmm. which is in Berkeley, but I don't know the exact... It, it would have been right soon after Tim... Uh, All right, so Bob was still in the band. Yes, yeah, okay, yeah, so, so he's still yeah, there. Never, yeah, 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 so was, yeah, Bob was still in the band, and, um... Uh, probably 85 -ish. Yeah, actually, no, it was before Tim. It was, I'm sorry, it was Let It Be. Okay, Let so It Be is the record. Okay. That's the record that, that was, yeah. Um, yeah, with I Will Dare and all that stuff. So that was the record. It was, that was the one. I, I heard Tim after that, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, good stuff. Now, how were you brought onto the project? I, I, what I've mm -hmm. heard is there was, they had started recording it in, like, Woodstock. Yes. And... They weren't happy. I don't know who they're recording with, but in, right. tell, tell us through as much well, as you can through the whole. <clears throat> okay, how did I get involved in the replacements? Uh, uh, they were. Um, I I was I had done some work for Warner Brothers, and I uh, was working with, uh, with them, and had done this new Monkeys project, which is this. You know, basically, they're trying to revitalize the Monkeys trademark, and so I'd done this track, and it um, turned out really well, and they liked it, and so I guess I was kind of in their mind for projects, and through the course of. Doing that, I met some of the higher ups at Warner Brothers and became, you know, became at least on a conversational basis with them. And I found that the replacements were making a record, so I called Stephen Baker and I said, "Yeah, I'm really interested in doing this because I'm a big fan of the band." He's like, "You know, I'm really excited that uh, you're excited, but you don't have a track record. You know, up until that point in time, I'd done uh, some Faith No More stuff, but none of their stuff had broken through. So I was basically an unknown." Uh, and I said, "Well, I'd love to work with them." And so they were, I guess, uh, I'm not sure how, which was first, but I know at one time they were. Um, uh, oh, they they worked with Tony Berg for a couple weeks, and Tony Berg, Berg B E R G. B -E -R -G okay. They worked with Tony Berg, and depending on who you speak to, he either quit or was fired. Uh, and supposedly there were some altercations involved in that. So anyway, so along the line, I, I, I would call up you know Stephen Baker at Warner Brothers like, hey, you know, I heard uh, Tony Berg's not on the on the project. You know, can I do it? And then he'd say something like, well, actually they're meeting with Scott Litt, you know, who did all the REM stuff right. for us, and and we're hoping this will work out, but we'll keep you posted. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, from what I hear, this is of course third party information, they met with Scott Litt and ended up duct taping him to a chair. And he basically said, you know, I'm, I'm not interested. Um, so all this time I keep bugging them, and so finally I get this phone call from Stephen Bacon at Warner Brothers, and he says, uh, he goes, uh, look, they've been through a couple producers, uh, this is really a long shot, um, but would you have a conversation with Paul on the phone? I said, of course. And at the time, I worked at Slash Records for a year. I was a staff producer and A&R guy. And uh, so I ended up calling Paul, and we talked for whatever it was, you know, half hour or so. And, uh, and, um, and, and I think the fact that I was basically an unknown worked in my favor. The fact that I'd done this new monkeys thing, which was completely laughable as, a, as any kind of, you know, credit. And uh, so I was talking to Paul, and he says, you know, well, we, you know, we, we kind of like to drink a bit. So, I mean, you're aware of that. I said, yeah, I've seen your shows. And by the way, I don't really drink at all. It doesn't work for me, so we'll get along just fine. And so we, I, Paul and I talked, and then um, he and Slim, the new guitar player, came out. Mm -hmm. Slim Dunlap. And um, so then we, we started. We, we, we did a, a one track together, a song called They're Blind, worked on that. And then as that was turning out, well, I guess, then they brought the rest of the guys out. <clears throat> so that's the long answer to how I... Gotcha. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I have to say that... Um, 
actually, I had a friend of mine at Warner Brothers who, uh, this woman, Dorothy Beaulieu, who's part of the A&R administration, she's the one who had hit me to the fact that, oh, by the way, they're not working with Scott. You really should call him up. And so I have to say that she was so great and just like, you know, call him up, you know, and so I did. And so, anyway. so I was just really perseverant. I mean, it wasn't, seriously, no credits and, and no notoriety got me that gig. I was, I was very perseverant and I... Just really wanting to. I really want, I wanted to work with that band. I had always felt that they were a fantastic band. I, I always thought that Paul was this kind of really incredible songwriter and you know he obviously was working within the confines of, of a of a really kind of a scrappy uh, punk band and to me that dichotomy was really interesting and you've got this guy who's writing beautiful songs that are really kind of heartfelt and real and, and deep and then you kind of throw them into this mix of these guys who basically don't let you take yourself too seriously all the time and it was a really fantastic blend of music I I was a big fan the moment I heard them I, was, I thought this is great you know I just I love it so. now, <clears throat> how how long did you guys record for? Too damn long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, working with the replacements, it was not so much a, a job as it was a, basically a commitment <laughs> uh, to hanging on to a, a runaway freight train. And that was really it. So when they said to you, it's like, you know, when Paul said to you, it's like, we like to drink a little, it's like, that was, was that not really... I wasn't surprised at all. I'd seen their shows. I knew no, that. I mean, was it, were you still, <clears throat> when you got into the studio, did you, were you still not ready for? I wasn't prepared for the level of challenges and mayhem, uh, no doubt about mm -hmm. it. I, and, and to be honest, uh, for the first two weeks of that project, I, I went home to my then girlfriend, Lisa, and I just said, I'm going to quit this thing. I mean, I just, for the first, every single day, I was like, I am not going to do this. And it, and it was really a difficult situation for me because. Here's an opportunity to be established as a producer, work with a well-known band, very, very talented. You know, the whole I think the whole group are all talented guys. Mm -hmm. But every day was just so bone-crushingly difficult, you know. And it was also exacerbated by the fact that I, I hired this engineer, Bev Jones, and, you know, so we started making this record. And I think it was by Wednesday, they wanted us to go out drinking with them. And I said, well, you know, I don't really drink. Oh, they actually wants to drink on the job. I said, I don't really drink, and Bev said, look, I don't drink on the job, but we'll go out with you. So <clears throat> we went out that Wednesday night, and that was a, a completely another story. But the next day, Bev Jones showed up late, and I could tell by the look on his face that that was it. And he walked in, and he said, I'm done. So I ended up <clears throat> not only producing, but I ended up engineering this project. And it was very challenging. What, I mean, just out of curiosity, <clears throat> what was it about one night of drinking that... I mean, it's a, there's a lot of stories from that night, but it started with I mean, I mean, how, how I don't know how detailed you guys want with this yeah, stuff. Go with it. Okay. And, what, and the thing is, and, and what <coughs> is like, this is a love story to the band. Oh, of course, it's a love story. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, I mean, I'm not like people have talked about drugs. There is not going to be one mention of drugs in this. So, if right. anything, it's like too off, off the right. wall. It's in, right. you know. Right. But it's like if there's something that's slightly amusing, you know, that, yeah. then it'll go well, there's, there's quite a few amusing stories because we know the replacements and they that's kind of how they travel. Right. But so we we went out to the uh, to the Rainbow Room and uh, again I'm 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 really a, a tea toller so I went out there okay we'll hang out with these guys and their whole idea is that if you drink you'll let down your guard and you'll really become real with each other you know, so we went out there and I had my you know half of a whatever it was I was trying to trying to stomach and trying to be a you know social drinker and so we sit down I'm sitting with Tommy and he takes a magic marker and he puts it right on the knee of my jeans I'm like oh man come on. And he digs it and he just draws it right over my favorite shirt and down across my pants. I'm like, this is not happening. So then I took, and of course, I had to draw on him because that's part of the, the ritual, I guess. And it, and it got to the point where, you know, Slim was doing all this drinking. And he started really, I mean, basically, he, he threatened me numerous times on the record to beat me up. And, you know, at this, at, so we're in this bar. I'm not even a drinker. This isn't even my milieu at all. And, uh, and he starts kind of saying, you know, I'm a lot older than you. I know a lot more than you. You don't know shit. You know, fuck you, blah, blah, blah pushes his forehead against mine, he starts this whole thing. Slim. Yeah. And he's like just holding my head there, you know. You don't know shit, you know. I'm like, oh my God. And you know, the bartenders, you know, cleaning the glass, like, hey, you guys okay, you know, and it just got to this thing. I'm like, God dang it. You know, I just it just just wasn't where I wanted to be. Anyway, so, you know, the next day, of course, Slim completely forgot everything. He was a smidgen nicer to me and Bev Jones, that was it. He was gone. So there I'm stuck with basically four guys three who were go out of the way to be really difficult to me and Chris the only the drummer was actually the only guy who didn't you know you know threaten me or, or do something unpleasant mm -hmm. 
I mean, at, at that point, <clears throat> were you starting to see friction between Chris and the band? Because he was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. It was really interesting. You know, there was a, there was definitely friction in the in, within the band because. I mean, specifically, we'd be recording, you know, and, and, and Paul would be like, God, Chris, you know, you got to, come on, you got to keep up with us, you know, we got to, you know, what's going on, you know, you're, you're lagging, you know, and I, you know, I'd pull up the click track and pull up the drums, like, you know, Chris is on it, you know, but they, but typical, and this is really typical of pretty much any guitar player, uh, myself included, you know, you're always kind of leaning forward of, of the beat, and, you know, and so, of course, the drums, like, the drums are behind, but they were really just so on top of the beat, you know, so I tried to kind of, Defend him, but but you know they, they they just want they just want to hear what they want to hear. They want that excitement, and I look, I can look. I learned a lot. I mean, I have to say, you're right. This whole thing is a love story to the re replacements. I just spoke to Paul three days ago. We're still we're actually friends, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a major miracle. Because you obviously you went back and like, yeah. there's, there is another story. But yeah. you also went and did his first solo, right? Yeah, I did his first solo. Yeah. Record. I also set up his stu his first studio at his house with okay. you know 16 tracks of ADATS. I made it boneheadedly simple. This system that relatively complex. I basically had a couple of switches I modified, so it was like record mix you know what i mean that kind of thing so uh so we're friends but i mean making that record I, you know it's the only record looking back i'm not sure if i would do again wow only because it was so brutal it was really I really mean, how many, really how many weeks did it go do you remember you know we did probably about maybe a week of, of rehearsal then we did uh probably i think it was like two weeks of tracking at cherokee we did another week or two of overdubs at cherokee but then we ended up going to uh, Paisley Park, and I think we did a couple more weeks there. We went. We went to Prince. Uh, Princess yeah, Princess too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the, I mean again, the replacements. The story's fall. I mean, literally, our first date at, at at Paisley Park. We're working in their uh, room that has an API board. It's this vintage board, and they had just you know cleaned it up. And we're the first guys to take this thing for a spin. And the very first moment we walk in, Paul spills a tumbler of Jack Daniels across 16 channels of the faders, and you can just see the the tech there just you know just is crestfallen you know he's like you know uh, you know I mean you know but it's just you know I, Paul didn't do it intentionally it's just it's just kind of that's kind of what I mean that's also what's endearing about the band is that they have the whatever the chutzpah or the the they're open to the experience and they're open to being rock and roll guys and they're mm -hmm. open to they're open to kind of being what you expect and and it's it's great to witness it for a while it's fantastic to be in the room and be part of that burning spark and that that energy is fantastic you know being in a, in a extended period of time is just harrowing mm -hmm. you know it really is i mean and I, I literally after two weeks i mean i you know i had this like 82 honda accord I, you know and i drive the guys back and forth i pick them up at the hotel in the morning and drive because you know none of them drove and um and I, you know, for entertainment, I always do like these handbrake turns I, on my own. But one day, I was just so tired of these guys, like you know, all their crap. And we were coming to a stop sign, just like, you know, just did this thing with the car. They all just like freaked out. You know, did I ever do that again? You know, I was like, that was the turning point for me. He's like, you know what? Fuck all you guys. And I decided I'm gonna make this record. If you all die in the process, I'm gonna make it. Mm -hmm. And not that that would ever happen. I, I can't make the record without the guys. But I decided I was in for the haul. And I was going to make that record, and come hell or high water, no matter what happened, I was going to finish it. And you know, a a after the fact, Michael Hill, was, who was our A and R guy, was was amazed that I survived. He says, "I, I you know, we had so many times we figured you weren't going to, you weren't going to hang in there." <laughs> you know, I was young and stupid, and uh, and I was a big fan. I mean, I was a huge fan. That was the thing that was so difficult. I'm a fan, you know, and you see these guys, you know, you know, literally splintering instruments and burning hundred dollar bills and you know, stay up till five in the morning. You know, we had Tom Waits come in. I mean, all these things. You're just in this whirlwind of mayhem, uh, and 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 you know, the, and they they're erasing tapes, and you're just like, I'm just like, you know, I've got these balls, and I'm trying to juggle, and you know, they're trying to like, you know, knock my feet up from underneath me. And in the in the process, we made a fantastic record, but man, it was brutal. Now, let's let's talk about the actual make. The, let's right. talk about the, the the actual album and even <coughs> the outtakes, which, which right. like, let's just so people know. It's like I mean, I always wonder. It's like. You, know, you, you like the, the re, you obviously saw the re-release that came out, you know, with the extra take. Right, okay. right, right. Were those extra tracks all during your session? Uh, yeah, there were some. I mean, I think. I mean, I don't. You know, I'm not sure if I even have a copy of that whole thing. To be honest, uh, I, I am uh, cognizant of it because they everyone had talked to me throughout the process. Mm -hmm. We're trying to dig up these tapes. You know, and they say we're trying to find um, you know outtakes. And I said, you know what? Unfortunately, for Don't Tell a Soul, there the only outtakes I had were on quarter-inch tape. You know, and they said, what happened? I said, well, while we're making this record, 
the, the band asked our assistant, Mike Bosley, they go, you know, how do we get rid of outtakes, you know, so that no one can ever use them? He goes, well, you know, you just run them through a bulk eraser and they'll erase everything, you know. And so the, all of a sudden, in the middle of this session, they started grabbing two-inch reels, going to this bulk eraser, erasing these tapes. And I literally grabbed a master out of one of their hands. So I'm trying to hold on to this stuff. We had some outtakes. There's a song called We Know the Night. That was this gorgeous track we were working on. And that one, unfortunately, you know, didn't make it. And so, so I mean, again, I literally am holding on to and sitting on the physical two-inch tapes, trying to protect them from being erased. And, and the, the, I think the band's aesthetic is that they know they like to drink. They know they're, they're a bunch of hellions. I, they don't want record of that. They don't want people to hear them at their worst down the road. So their idea is sound. I mean, you want to get rid of yeah. the outtakes. Unfortunately, you know. And yet, and yet they release shit hits to fans. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they do. I mean, they're, they're really a contradiction in terms. Yeah. And they're the biggest dichotomy, the biggest... I mean, yeah, it's hard to make heads or tails of the mm -hmm. band, uh, which is also, again, what makes them endearing. You know, I mean, the fact that they really are polarized and they will sing really gorgeous, intimate, beautiful songs, mm -hmm. and then they'll just rip your face off with just punk rock, and it's fantastic. The, um, <coughs> so one of the, the one of the tracks, that when, I, when I got the extras, it's like, yeah, I mean, there were alternate takes and stuff and so forth, but the one that really blew me away was the Slade cover, Goodbye to Jane. <laughs> and was that one of the things you were You know what? It's interesting. I am, supposedly that was done while I was working with them. Mm -hmm. And by all indications it was, and uh, I I can barely remember. I mean, there are there are other outtakes, other things we'd, we'd done that I remember. We had a night basically where Tom Waits showed up and then, you know, the band stayed up till five in the morning and they just did all these covers. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it makes sense that, that Goodbye to Jane was done then, but that's the only moment I can't I remember. Kind of like, was, was, was there, I mean, there were more covers with Tom Waits. That would have been like... Oh, the Tom Waits was fantastic. It was a really wonderful... Yeah, was the stuff erased? Uh, yeah, there was. There's very. I've got little bits and pieces on on like dats. Uh, mm -hmm. They had done that song. Uh, it was like a Terry Jackson. I got two strong arms. I can help. And it's a song from like mm -hmm. the '70s, and 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 they did that. And Tommy just did a fantastic, fantastic rendition where he butchered the lyrics, and it was really funny. And it was just, it was really great. I mean, it was a lot of fun, but it was, yeah. again, a goodbye, Jane. Uh, yeah. Did that just yeah, that just sounded like a great live kind of thing yeah. that was just a yeah, weird, yeah, it probably was, but I can't even remember that for the life of me. And I and I think you know, I think part of it's just out of out of fear and just trying to keep everything together. I think my mind got into this like kind of primal survival mode and just like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, cuz also it was really interesting. I had to like we did that this song called Date to Church that I think was a that was B-side yeah. or that was one of those things. And that was with Tom Waits and it's the kind of thing that, you know, you've got 2-inch tape which only can record 16 minutes and then you got to it takes you a couple minutes to put up another re reel, so you've got to be ready when to record these guys. And with the replacements, they don't go, okay, here we go, one, two, three. It's just like they're going. And if you listen to that track, you'll hear in the beginning, Paul goes, are we rolling? And and I capture that because I happen to be like, okay, I can smell it. This thing's going to start going. And and you're constantly recording. You know, they nothing happens. You, you try to rewind really quickly. They get ready to go, and you just stop, hit record again, and hope to catch. You're trying to catch, you know, lightning in a bucket is what you're trying to do so yeah. i'm sure goodbye to jane was one of those moments and i just i think i'm you know, just, <clears throat> yeah. just really and and again it, if i had an engineer and i could kind of hang out and you know okay this is great you know but i was just like oh my god just really trying to hang out for dear life mm -hmm. now the, the actual songs in the album, what songs do you stood out as either wow this just came together perfectly and beautifully and i'm really happy with it or this song was like going to be the death of me either oh you go either goodness. way first so which are pick your Let's see if I can remember. I mean, uh, uh, asking me lies was really difficult because it was an anomaly for what that band does. It was kind of, kind of funky and turkey. Right, yeah, it's really uh, an outlier on that record. Um, and so that was really kind of challenging. That one was really difficult, but I s am really thrilled with the results. Even though it's not really, it's not really a replacement song so much as this. Uh, it will inherit the earth to me. Mm -hmm. Was, was our attempt at trying to make something really grand, as big and as panoramic and cinematic and deep and resonant as, as I think we could ever make. Uh, you know, I, we, were, we were trying for something. <clears throat> I don't know if we, you know, if we succeeded or not, right. but I, to me, I was really excited that I was able to work with them and we were able to get to that place. Uh, what the is song this? that people love from this album is Aiken to Be. Well, Aiken to Be is the best. I mean, it's the best song, hands down. It's, it's the best written song, and it's a stunning performance. And that is just, that to me... That's kind of one of those highlights of working with the band. I mean, that that aching to be is one of the reasons why you hang on for all the crap, is because you get those gems that are just timeless and gorgeous, and you know. Did I mean? <clears throat> uh, 
I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge Alls Country fan. Mm-hmm. And the, you're talking now, so you're recording this in 88 88, yeah. It was. So th- there ain't much Alls Country at this point. You're right. And Aiken to Be is would definitely fall into that category without question. Did, I mean, not that obviously, hey, we're inventing a new category, but I mean, there was a country flavor. Again, and of yes. course, I look at this band, you look at Hoot Nanny, yeah. it's 10 different bands. Yes. Okay. And the same thing, like you just said, Asking Me Lies mm-hmm. is, and Aiken to Be, and what's the, Anywhere's Better Than Here. Oh, that's, goes, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's all different bands, yes. which is what's one of the things that's amazing about the replacements. Yes. You didn't have every song sounding alike. Yes. But did you, I mean, what was the, was there ever like, was was ever was Aiken to Be ever a regular replacement song, or what What was the decision to put in the uh, steel guitar and so forth? You know, I don't, that's a good question. I don't know if any, I think once the band evolved, I don't think there ever was kind of a standard replacement song anymore. I think for me, it all started once they kind of made that, that quantum leap from being a punk rock band into where Paul finally felt confident enough to sing the more delicate stuff. Mm-hmm. I think once he was open to that, and once the band was open to that, that was actually, that was actually the, the source and the birthplace of Aiken to Be. I think Aiken to Be only could happen, you know, once he once he did. There, here comes a regular, because here comes a regular was a much of an anomaly and an outlier on that record as oh, Aiken yeah. to Be was, you know, uh, on on Don't Tell a Soul. So to me, I think it's just Paul trusting himself when he wrote a great song, mm-hmm. and and the band backing him and saying, you know, okay, it's a great song, we're going to do it. Uh, so for me, I guess that's the answer to that question. And yeah, I agree that it was it was really kind of the beginning of, at least somewhere along the the vanguard of, of alt country. And yeah. the fact that those guys were able to get there and do it well before other bands, and they also had the backbone to do it because I think it would have been really easy to not have included "Here Comes a Regular" or not have included, you know, "Aiken to Be" because it wasn't the replacements or it wasn't punk rock. Yeah, or Skyway. And, on, on yeah, the, exactly. Uh, Skyway. Movie. Yeah. I mean, those are just really stunning songs. I think I think Paul. And the band, they hung in there long enough for him to find him, his voice as a writer. Mm-hmm. And that to me was what was so exciting about them. Because they, you know, and I'm sure he got a lot of grief when he was trying to do these kind of songs. Like, come on, man, you can't do that. That's it's not punk rock. Yeah. But I think Paul either figured it out that it was more punk rock to do that kind of thing on a punk song, on a, with a punk rock band. Mm-hmm. Or he just started following his own muse and just said, you know what, I don't know if we're punk rock or not, but but here's a song that I'm going I'm to sing. Right. Because I mean, cause then you go back to um, or go forward to it. It's I think it's after it on the album, but uh, anywhere it's better than here yeah. is sounds like it could have been from yeah. you know, easily let it beat. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, cause yeah. that, that scream at yeah. the beginning is yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely, which, yeah, I, it, yeah, yeah. It's true though, and I think all that. What's interesting about that band is as they grew, all those pieces of the band still lived within. The band as a unit and each individual member, the, all that stuff was still there. It's not like they ever left their punk rock roots. Like some bands kind of just leave it behind, they move on, and they become something else. Those guys never, it never left them. It was always part of their DNA. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, anywhere's better than here, that comes out. You're just like, you know, it's it's really, it's bracing, you know. And it was really intentional when, you know, in the era of, of an LP where you had, you know, two sides of it. I remember Paul and I talking about it. And, and his whole thing was like, you know, side two is going to wake you up, and it's going to really. Was that the first song on side two? I'm pretty sure it was. Okay. I'm pretty sure because I, I know it came after. Uh, I think uh, uh, what was the, the uh, they're blind. I think it was the last on side one, and then I think that was the opener for side two. And I yeah. just think that was just that thing where you're just. And it was really interesting. He always had this thing where you get to this place where, um, you know, you find these really tender moments. You get really kind of. Uh, Emotional, and then he, the 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 formula was always to come back with something that just kind of is will kind of snap you out of it and kind of get you back on into life again. And mm-hmm. I think that was one of those moments where you have you know they're blind, and then then you wake up with this you know cold water slap across the face, and right. you're back into like you know punk rock, rock and roll. Were any of the songs just hellish? I mean, more than <laughs> more than any of the others. <sighs> no, it's just making the whole record was pretty much hell. So I, would have to, I would have to say a, uh, a Could Be was probably one of the easier ones. Okay. Uh, just because I think it was just, it was what it was. And Who played Lap Steel? I'm, you know what? That's either going to be Paul Slim? or Slim. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, there were no other session musicians? No, I, I don't remember. I mean, you know, someone may contradict me and say we brought Greg Lease in there, but but I, I think that's all the band. That's all those guys. I don't remember any... The only guy I remember coming in was Tom Waits to, to play it, you know, and but the rest of it was really them. And that's one thing I think that, that Slim brought, really brought to the table is that kind of that kind of style of guitar playing, you know, and, and he was a real good foil to what Paul could just lay down the blistering, you know, punk rock stuff. But I think Slim was more studied and more kind of 
qu uh, quieter and more careful in his approach to the guitar. He really kind of thought out his parts, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was really, they were really a, a nice uh, contrast, I think, between the two of them. I was to, yeah, it, it, when, especially seeing them, I always felt mm -hmm. that he sort of brought a Keith Richards esque yeah, kind of he did. thing to the band. He really did, yeah, yeah which was really, really cool. You which know? is not a bad thing to have brought yeah. in, let's say, so I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean back to back to difficult songs. I mean, I, th I have to say that uh, their blind was a really difficult one because we started with that song first. You know, we recorded it, and you know, we kind of felt our way through. It, but it it didn't feel like a replacement song until much later in the process. But I mean, we really, you know, I think Paul Slim and I spent a good portion of a week just kind of like feeling each other out and then working on that song. And then and that was one of the last songs to kind of finally be mixed, and, and so it really kind of came to fruition at the very end. So that was one that was difficult along the way. Uh, um, I'll Be You was a really difficult one because we that one, I think we had a feeling could become a single and we wanted to get that one just right and it had to still feel like the replacements but also feel a little bit like radio. So, mm -hmm. and, and actually the most difficult part of the whole process actually was the mixing part because that was another one of those moments of, of jumping off of one place and going to another. Mm -hmm. uh, all the mixes I had done, Paul and I had talked about making a classic record that had a sound that you couldn't pinpoint what era it came from. And we had always moved in that direction all the all the rough mixes i'd done which weren't stunning by any by any stretch of the imagination but they kind of continued the aesthetic we were working on, on the record and i think at the record label in an attempt to you know bring them more towards the masses you know with the enlisted uh crystal analogy so he'd mix it in a certain way that you know for me uh while it worked at that time and i think it made uh you know you know i'll be you kind of sound more like radio to me that kind of dates that record you know uh, the sound because it sounds like the end of the 80s to mm -hmm. me just by virtue of the sounds and things like that again the drums the drums especially sound like the 80s and and there's there's two arguments one is well you know what that sound helped get them on radio and help them I think that's their biggest selling record they ever had mm -hmm. so that's the good side of it that the the flip side is that it didn't sound the classic sound that I wanted and I think that Paul wanted we, we wanted to sound like you couldn't tell if it came from 1968 or, you know, 1980. I mean, you, I mean just mm -hmm. can you give me an example of what sound you would like? Either another replacement or just someone's album. I mean, like, what uh, would, if you could have said, I really would have loved for it to sound like. Uh, I have to think about that. I mean, just, you know, anything from, you know, a, a blend of, you know, the Rolling Stones to, to the replacements, uh, let it be to, I mean, just, you know. Yeah, let it be. Just had a, had a great sound. You that, can't that, tell where Let It Be comes from. Yeah, I like that record. That one really just sounds like the band. And it sounds yeah. like the band with a bit of polish. And even, even Tim, to another extent, has some of that too. But I, I just like that sound. And to me, I just wanted to sound like a band mm -hmm. in the room, you know, with some, with some you know, embellishments is yeah. what I wanted. Um, and um, anyway, but, you know. Now, now did, <clears throat> um, how much was recorded? I mean, did the, what was take me through the recording process in terms of what the band was doing? I mean, early stuff. Obviously, the band just picked up their guitars, played. Yeah. It was you know, right. like Nanny was notoriously just live. Yeah, right. Um, I'm assuming this <clears throat> wasn't that live. I mean, was were, were we now into like everyone playing yeah. parts separately? And yeah, we pretty much were. We uh, you know we started, we tracked it, we spent a couple of weeks tracking in the big room at Cherokee, and we was that was really ostensibly to get the drums. Uh, and based on which is what we did so mm -hmm. and uh, we may have kept a couple of guitar parts here and there but then we went to the, the back room I think it was the studio three or studio C and we spent a week or two overdub so that was very much an overdub record I mean there's very you know very little of it was live uh, you know and um, and it's interesting that that record I had some friends who were friends of various bands and you know, I tell you I you know tested a lot of friendships when they heard that record a lot of people didn't like that record at all. They were just really upset. It's not a replacements record. How could you do this to the band? Blah blah blah. You know, and I'd say, well, look, I hear what you're saying, but, but you know, the the record that uh, Jim Dickinson did didn't sound like a replacements record either. You know, Please to Meet Me is actually more polished than what we did. Mm -hmm. You know, very, pretty slick and really airtight. So, and they had, by the way, it had horns on there. And for me, and horns, strings. yeah, horns and strings on a replacement record. That right there, that's already against the grain. And and. And uh, so, but it was really interesting how many bands were just like, you know, really love their presence and you basically ruined them. And I was like, oh man, you know, come on. You know, and uh, anyway, so that but was. Again, though, but again, what you're saying though is a lot of it had to do with the mix. Well, a lot of it had to do with the mix. There's certainly that aspect of it. And, you know, let's say, and you didn't write some of the songs. I, I think yeah. like, there are definitely songs that don't sound like replacement songs, yeah. like Back to Back and a few others right, that are just right. not typical replacement right. songs. Right. You know, um, 
Yeah, I also think the fact that we were trying to make a bigger record, I think with Inherit the Earth and stuff like that, where we were really kind of pushing the envelope. I think Paul and I, I don't know if we, uh, you know, we, I think we kind of talked about this, but we maybe talked around it, and that is we really wanted to try to make something, some of the songs to sound big and sound, to see, yeah, to see how far we could take the replacements. And I think a lot of my friends were really kind of chafed at that idea that, that you know, we would have all these, overdubs and these things we were trying to do and you know these kind of sonic landscapes i think they were really upset because they wanted to hear the replacements and again i still go back to the fact there were horns on the previous records like you know what guess what if they can do horns we can do this other stuff and it, to me i felt like our that don't tell us it was more of a replacements record than than uh, please to meet me and i love please to meet me mm -hmm. but but you know. i mean i i think yeah i think i mean it's <clears throat> also the different songs you know yeah. um yeah. and I, it, yeah, the one argument probably i've heard a you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, it, it, the one argument probably I've heard a lot from people in Minneapolis is, please make me still have the ghost of Bob. Because some of those songs came from the Bob era. Right. And honest to God, most people, they don't, they, being in Minneapolis and talking to many people, we, I mean, your interview, you're past 110 at this point. You're probably 111 or 12. We, we're really pushing the interviews. People, the, the, the consensus is the replacements died when Bob left. Right. So. Right, you right. Can, you take take that yeah. off of your. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, he was really the heart and soul of that band, you know. Uh, but unfortunately, it was a heart and soul that was really short lived, and and you couldn't maintain that kind of energy yeah, no, right. and that lifestyle. Yeah, it lifestyle. just it just wouldn't. It it just burns out bright, and yeah. um, and I think yeah, I think Paul had the, a lot of the guitar playing obviously on his shoulders, you know, for please. I mean, he had to kind of pick up where Bob left off and yeah. do what he could. But yeah, yeah. The, I and think he also right. had a lot harder songs on please to meet me. I mean, the first, yeah. you know, I mean. IOU and, yeah. and, and you know uh, I mean th th there were some real rock and songs yeah. where, I yeah. mean you had like I mean you, you had a bunch you had a lot of like slower songs yes I mean rock and roll ghost rock and roll like, ghost yeah I mean, you know and, and inherit your earth and yeah. you know I mean so yeah yeah you know. And even they're blind, and also um, a darling one. They, we uh, there was definitely a much more down tempo yeah. record. I mean, you're right. So I mean, I, I wasn't going in there with a bunch of rock stuff that I slowed down. I was like, well, this is kind of where the band was at at that time, right. where Paul was as a writer. So. And especially when you go to the next record, you could see. That, I mean, you were like one step to. Yeah. Well, the next record, like, really Paul's first solo yeah. album. Yeah. It really. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think I did the last replacements record, and then yeah. that was the. But also that being said, I think I think even. Don't Tell So was the beginning of Paul's solo record because a lot of the songs were kind of Paul mm -hmm. songs and even our approach was really kind of becoming more of a Paul solo record thing. And then obviously uh, uh, All Shook Down was, I think the band played on one of those tracks and the rest of it's all session guys. Right, so that's that, that, right. Yeah, that, that. So that was now, now, was, <clears throat> um, did the band, uh, other than, I mean, I guess they picked on Chris and that, that's, we've heard of that a lot, which, um, uh, which seemed like I was thought Chris Mars was one of the great underrated drummers. Absolutely, rock, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, was um, I, did the band get along? I mean, were they, would they did they work? I mean, was did it slim fit in? I guess, and were Tommy and Paul gelling? And yeah, I think they're all gelling. I mean, I think I think that that Paul and Tommy in particular, and then Slim next, kind of gelled, and it was really a an. A, uh, an us against the world mentality. I think the fact that they'd been through a number of producers, I think there was probably a feeling of this is kind of a make or break thing. I think if they went through a third producer, I think the chance of them making the record would be pretty skinny. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I think there was, there was a bit of that. I think, you know, they, they're out in LA making a record with a, basically a nobody. I was not established at all. Um, and so, yeah, I think there was a lot of that. They, I think they kind of bonded, you know. Um, and I think I, I was kind of the the common enemy. I mean, I certainly had that feeling. I mean, I'm not exaggerating how many times that I was, you know, threatened. You know, you know, you touch our guitars, we're going to kill you. You do this, you, you know. I mean, those, you know, I mean, I, and I think Paul, I think Slim became kind of the band or Paul's kind of like bulldog. I mean, he, I, I think for Slim to establish himself in the pack, he had to kind of cut his teeth on me and it was pretty apparent I mean it was it was really bumpy mm -hmm. you know I mean, and I think that's just I think that's how how Slim became kind of cool I think he was able to kind of say or do the things that maybe Paul wanted to do or, or Tommy so it was just you know kind of unleashed him because I mean seriously you know all, you know because th th there was some sketchy playing and I had to go <coughs> and fix a bunch of stuff and I was threatened for that, for that. I mean like you know you touch our stuff, we're gonna kill you, you know. But there was stuff that was off time, out of tune, and you know they would leave, and I would have to kind of meticulously go through and kind of put things and try to, fi you know, 
run them through a delay and set them back in time so they were with 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 uh, Chris's drumming, you know, because otherwise things were just so far forward leaning. I had to kind of move it back so that it sat in time with him, so that it felt like a cohesive band. But but Chris's drumming was on. With he you. was on. I mean, wow. he Chris. I mean, he, hears, he, he, seemed, he seemed like the guy who was like at that point was, was tired of it all. I think he was tired. I think he was probably the probably the one of the more grounded guys, and just he was certainly the nicest guy. You know, I mean, I, he and I don't have the the bond that I do with Paul these days, you know, because I think you know we just went through hell with Paul. On two records, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think Chris was there to do a, a work really hard and do a good job, and he wasn't up for the, you know, the mayhem. You know, I think he he just wasn't wasn't up for it. And that wasn't. I think he was, you know, I think he was probably the um, he was probably the balance on the uh, of the of the band when, when when Bob was in the band. I think I think Chris was the more kind of normal. Absolutely. Let's not get into too much trouble. And Bob was the the other side. Those are the two bookends, and then you know, Paul and Tommy were kind of in the middle there, and mm -hmm. you know. To varying degrees, you know. Instigating both of them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because I mean, when I first met Tommy, I mean, I, you know, Paul and Slim came out. We worked on, you know, uh, They're Blind, and then uh, then Tommy and Chris came out, and we we met at Musso and Frank's. You know, Michael Hill takes us out to dinner, and so I finally meet these guys. You know, we're talking, and on the way back, you know, we're walking down uh, whatever it was Hollywood or Sunset Boulevard, one of the boulevards, and uh, you know, Tommy turns to me, he goes, "You know, what I think of you. You know, what do you, you know, no, what do you think of me?" You know, he, he goes, and he just spits on the ground. You know, and I, and I hadn't said any of, uh, more than two words to this guy. You know, but it was part of that, you know, part of that gang. You know, they're they're a gang, and you know, I'm the outsider, and you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna take it out on me. And you know, like I say, after two weeks of that, I was like, I'm either you know, I'm gonna make the record. So, but the yeah. was I mean, what was the um, mm -hmm. what was the label happy with the record? I think they were, and from what I can tell, I think they were happy with it. You know, I think it, you know, again, it, I think it, I think it did, it's d did the best, you know, commercially of all the records. So I think they were. I mean, you know, obviously everyone was hoping that it maybe it would go further. You know, we'd like to maybe go into, you know, you know, I think there was always that feel. I know with Paul, there was always this kind of a friendly competition with with REM. They really always wanted to do what REM did. You know, that was kind of the big thing. Seriously. Yeah, yeah, cuz well, you know, they, I think they, you know, they started around the same time. They're obviously very different bands. Uh, and I think that was, you know, there was always that, you know, kind of thing where they, you know, trying to get to that. And you know, in the same basically the same record label and but um, you know, the difference is that REM I think played the game more astutely. I mean, you know, <clears throat> the losing my religion video Bastards of Young video. Oh yeah, I mean, in a time when MTV is everything. Yeah, and, and that, that basically that's it. But and also everyone you work with, you know, REM. I think you know they're. And I'd worked with them for one, you know, just a day basically. But I, just, I think they're more professional and they're more open to the idea of you have to kind of you know grease the wheels. You need to kind of be pleasant to the people who are going to basically work your record. You know, and I think their placements just weren't up for that kind of thing. They they, they that just wasn't in their makeup and so I think you know if you're a person working at Warner Brothers on a Friday night and you get a call like okay you got to work longer tonight for one of these two bands you know and if, you know if one band's really nice the other band kind of you know are difficult I, I don't know it's it's tough it's it's a real love-hate relationship and and you know and they made some great music and I love their music and I love Paul as a friend now you know it's really great but man you know <laughs> it's just being in the mix of them is just Horrific, mm -hmm. you know it really is. Now, uh, <laughs> as a fan, for a second, what, what are your? I mean, going over the catalog, what are your favorite? What are, what's your favorite album? What's your what are your favorite replacement songs? Oh man, I mean, for me, it's. I I, I love Tim because I love Tim because it just has the, it the the more melodic stuff started kind of coming out to the mm -hmm. forefront, like you know, "Kiss Me on the Bus," and I mean, there's just some really nice moments on that record i mean uh let it be for me is my it has to be my favorite because that was really the my eye-opening moment of seeing their places my friend martha who's my girlfriend at the time was like you gotta check out this band like and as soon as she put on i will dare i was like i got it and i was like loved it loved it loved it and then of course then i got into more of the more punkier stuff and so and then um you know please to meet me i mean there's just all oh, god that record i mean that one uh, you know, I mean, Alex Chilton, I mean, everything's on there, you know. I mean, all that, I mean, you know, Bastards of the Young, I mean, there's so many good, cool songs that they did that I, I can't really pick a favorite because to me, it's just, I think what they did is they kind of encompass the human condition where sometimes you feel like you want to rock out and be an asshole, sometimes you feel like you want, you're really tender, you want to be sensitive, and, and everything in between. And that they were one of the, probably the only band I can think of that really pursued both of those extremes. Mm -hmm. I think most of the bands kind of narrowed the, the, 
in the extremes. They kind of bring it in. There's kind of this airy work. And then the replacements, I think, unabashedly, you know, broke stuff and knocked it over and set it on fire and took you with them. And that was exciting to do, be a witness to. And then they also had these really, really tender moments. You know, I mean, here comes a regular. It's just one of those moments, you know, or answering machine. I mean, there's these moments that are just... The fact that they're on a record with this blistering mayhem makes them even more poignant and more beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had a whole record of Here Comes a Regular, it would just be yawn-inducing. But the fact that in between all this stuff, you have this moment where the guy is really tender is what makes it great. It's the mm -hmm. contrast. And those guys lived contrast. And they, and they wore them out. And they, they, it, nobody did that. No band came close to this band of really playing blistering music and then doing this tender thing. I mean, they were really, they were fantastic. I mean, what a, what a band. I mean, there's, what a band. I mean, that's, one, of, one of the greatest rock and, rock and roll bands. I think band. so. I really think so. If they were able to play the game a little bit better, they would have been a household name. I think, th and, and, and part of what made them great is also what was their downfall. And, and, and they really should have been one of the most well-known best bands ever. They really should have. You know, I mean, even the fact that, you know, they were on that Tom Petty tour, and, and obviously, from where I see it, Tom borrowed a lyric you know, from him, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I just think that, you know, it was just hard for them to, you know, I think it's, it was hard for them to kind of, you know, they liked being the underdog, but it was hard for them because they also wanted to be more, more popular, or, or, or people, people to get them and buy more of their stuff and and I think they're always at odds with that you know they, they wanted to get there but they also didn't want to do what you had to do to get there sometimes you know and and they were really true I mean those guys were true mm -hmm. you know? if you could do anything differently in regards to don't tell a soul now looking back over 20 years yeah they, they, I, I, I wouldn't change a thing except for I would love to have heard it mixed the way that Paul and I want it to be mixed and that if, if you know if we had a chance to do that that would be great because I, I I think we would have made a classic record that would have been even more stunning. I think it would have been, it would have, you know, you could have really connected the dots to a bunch of other bands once we had done that. I think that would have really been, <coughs> you know. And, would, and ba would you have basically, you would have basically just taken the production, I mean, the mix down a lot. In I, yeah, I, I just wanted to make it so that that you couldn't tell what era it was from. Yeah. And I wanted to so that, so that the drum sounded like, you know, more natural. Uh, and, and also, uh, Chris, uh, Lord Algy put a lot of um, like chorus on the guitars. There's there's a there's a kind of a mm -hmm. syrupy smear oh, so thing. That was all added after. Oh yeah, that was all added after. We didn't we didn't we, we didn't track with that stuff. So th that's what I'm saying. We we made a classic record. You know, in in Chris's defense, not everything was in the best of tune. So I think it was easier to kind of uh, make it more palatable by putting chorusing on it. So that made it so that people couldn't really tell. Oh wow, this guitar is kind of out of tune. It was just like. You know, there it is. Um, and I mean, look, this all goes back to decisions that the band and I made, and, and, and specifically the band. I mean, you know, I remember on uh, a couple of songs where, you know, Paul plays guitar part, you know, and I'd be like, oh, wow, that's a really cool part. Like, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's tune your guitar up and play a little more in time, you know. And Paul would be like, I forgot the chords, you know, which is basically like, fuck you. <laughs> it's done. And so that decision is the beginning of that's the germ of the seed of when eventually you get something like Chris Rodaggi to mix it he's he's fix. like okay this guitar is not quite in tune so I gotta do something with it and so as much as we want to blame Chris and say you know I wish we'd done it differently and, and he's like, like I'm trying to make it so that more people will want to buy it because we need to make it more accessible or palatable or, or understandable and so that's kind of how it goes you know and you know, who knows if, if if we'd mixed it more classically how much of the flaws and the, you know, the tuning issues would have come to the forefront. You but, know? but then you listen to, like, a, the, the reissue of Exile on Main Street. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that there are mis there oh, there, yeah. and mistakes all over that, but it, make, what it makes even yeah. more of a classic. I mean, that's, rock and roll is not perfection. I agree, but see, that I completely agree with that. Um, I agree. And even the Beatles, if you listen to the Beatles, there's stuff that's out of tune, out of pitch, and, and Led Zeppelin, everybody, yeah. you know, that's, but I also think that that was from an era that that was more acceptable, and it was also more of the norm. And when you get to the 80s, I mean, you know, we, we, by that time we were making the replacements record, there were already a bunch of records that were pretty, you know, perfect or pristine. A lot of the 80s stuff was about, you know, certainly the, the advent of the drum machine, and things were more kind of, 
you know, that big drum sound and everything. It became a different era. And so I think to go against that grain would have been better for the spirit of the band and the spirit of that record and for the long term. But again, for the short term benefit, I think I think the, one of the one of the costs of that was mm -hmm. that the record doesn't sound the way certainly what that Paul or I had envisioned it. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, and you know, if I had been more known as by then as a mixer, I probably would have had t taken a shot at right. it. But you know, I was, I was a nobody. You know, so it's like, you know. Now, now did you? <laughs> how do you feel though? I mean, because you talk about it, it, something that many people have said. I mean, I have, I have I have people saying they should have been the American Beatles. I mean, there, there should have been success here. Absolutely. But then you're, it's 1988, 1989. Two years later, a band out of Seattle, which really sort of sounds an awful lot like the replacements in Husker Du mixed together, mm -hmm. even wearing your old flannel, yeah. explodes and changes, all of a sudden revitalizes rock yeah. and roll, so to speak. I mean, should that have been them? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, look, in a perfect world, a universe, yes. Um, the replacements, you know, should have had at least some of the success that Nirvana had, absolutely. Um, but for better or for worse, the, uh, Nirvana played the game a bit better. And I think Kurt and Paul had real similar issues in being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I was actually, when we were making Paul's uh, solo record, actually Paul and Kurt met, I was there when they met at the Triton Hotel for just a brief moment, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it's, I think they were, they were both uncomfortable in their skin. And and out of that, that's that whole you know grain of sand in the oy in the oyster which makes the pearl. That thing where you're just so at odds with your world, or you don't know how you fit in. That you write these great songs, and yeah, I mean the, the replacement should have been had some of that success. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think Nirvana would have happened without the replacements, personally. But but um, but Nirvana made it happen. You know, yeah, you know, I, like the replacements. Yeah, you know, they were their own worst enemy. You know, they they just shot themselves in the foot so many times. You know, mm -hmm. um, whether it shows where you end up in a, like a drunken chaos, or you know, or not playing the MTV game. I mean, you know, that's just kind of what well, made them who they are. And it's too bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's too bad. It's really too bad. It's uh, funny. I was just going to say to you, you think they shot themselves in the foot? So thank you. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> they, I mean, the replacements were, I think, notorious for doing all the right things, certainly in songwriting and playing some fantastic shows, and then just completely shooting themselves in the foot. And, and the, look, the whole, for me, the whole replacement's aesthetic is this. You're playing a show, you're doing really well, and then one guy goes south. Either he makes a mistake, something happens, or he had too much to drink, and he goes south, and the whole replacement's aesthetic ideology is that when one guy goes south, you all go together. You know, it's not like one guy can have a bad show and everyone's kind of like, you know, props him up in the key goes like, no, oh, you're going south, we're going with you. And not only are we going to go with you, we're actually going to lead the charge and we're going to go there first. And that's just their thing, you know. And you would never see that with, you know, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers or even the Beatles or even the Rolling Stones. You know, I think a lot of the people that, you know, I think, I think Paul's a big fan of like Johnny Thunders, you know, from the New York Dolls. I, th I think that, I guess, of course, he went south pretty pretty well but uh but but these the other guys like the stones i know paul's a big stones fan a big keith richards fan and and they they all didn't collapse or implode simultaneously yeah. as long as somebody's holding up the ship and keeping the thing going then you're fine and i think that if they could have appreciated that what what chris did is really what charlie watts did he just held the foundation and he kept it going if they could have said okay you know you're not the hard drinker you know hellraiser that we are but we appreciate the fact that you're going to hold down the fort. Just like, I mean, they never gave Charlie Watts a bad time for being the guy who's just like, just keeps the beat, you know. And, you know, Keith Richards, you know, falling down stone at gigs, you know. I mix some Rolling Stone stuff. And after 20 years of playing the same damn songs, Keith Richards is still playing the wrong chords. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to fix things here and there. And that's just like, that's Keith Richards. But at least they had, you know, Ronnie Wood and they had Bill Wyman and they had these other guys who yeah. were kind of, okay, we're going to keep the foundation going. We'll keep the structure you guys go as far as you can, and if you fall off the cliff, well, you know, we'll, we'll pick you up and keep you going. Replacement's like, no. The closest I ever saw, I mean, because I, <laughs> I, um, I, and I was a huge fan, and I saw them a lot of times in 72, 73, 74, when, when they were still to get all of the original members right. there with Rod Stewart in the faces, which really reminded me of the replacements, because, I mean, there, were time, there was one tour where they had a full bar on the side of the stage. 
mean, that, that, they were the ones who started all of that. The TV set through the window in the pool. And, right. and at one point, Rod Serdinovich Faces could not book a hotel room in, in the United States. Of course. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, yeah. and it's funny because now you think of Rod Stewart as, you know, you know, a lounge singer. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, sure. yeah, and, and Rod Stewart was the, I remember one tour where he wore a ballerina's outfit on stage with a tutu. And I'm like, Bob might have worn a tutu, but I saw the person who wore it first. As, you know, I mean, that was, that was, right. it, but again, I think Paul wrote the liner notes, their box sets. So, I mean, there right. obviously was. Right. And, and the faces never really made it. The I mean, same they, thing. they never made it. I mean, not like the Stones, not like the Beatles. I mean, they, and they were terrifically talented band but yeah look if you trash enough hotel rooms and you can't book a tour yeah. the faces know. probably make more money now because of ooh la la being used in every commercial right. than they probably ever made back right. then I mean not kind of yeah. Rod Stewart stuff right. Maggie Mae was right, obviously right. a huge hit but right. yeah. yeah I mean so that's the thing I mean if you want to if you're going to accept that mantle and you're going to be that band you're going to burn every bridge you find mm -hmm. and that's what's going to make you endearing to people and it's also what's going to make people just want to run and you know, did um, there was uh, you mentioned Keith Richards just real quick. Uh, did they ever? I don't know if it was before. They did don't tell so because I thought it was it was it was around the same time. Uh, the Keith Richards birthday show they played in New York. Did you, any? Uh, could be. I don't know. You don't know I don't about, know about, about that. Yeah. yeah. Then I guess my other, my my last question is because is there anything that I didn't ask you about the band that you would want to say to the band to a new generation of possible fans or? Hmm, that's a good question. Hmm. Uh, the only I would say, and this pertains to bands, is that you can attain all of your goals that you decide you want to pursue. And all you have to decide is you have to be cognizant of the cost and if you want to pay it. And that's really it. I mean, it's really, for me, it's down to that. And, and, and you can go as far as you want. The replacements could have gone further if they want, were willing to pay the cost of you know, behaving a little more acceptably. Mm -hmm. uh, and conversely, REM could have been a much cooler rock band if they you know, had some more drunken shows and, and maybe trash some hotel rooms. I mean, so it just depends on what you want, what's, in, what's essential to you, and are you willing to shoulder that cost mm -hmm. and that's it and you know i mean that pertains to kurt cobain it pertains to everybody it actually pertains to your any, anyone's life but for bands in particular you just have to decide you know if you want to trash hotel rooms then that's that's the, the you're going to find a plateau of where you're at commercially and if you're willing to do it you know kind of go do meet and greets then you'll find a different one yeah. you know yeah, and eventually you're going to have someone with the label saying i'm sick of cleaning up your mess I think that's what happened. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is a replaceless thing or a Paul Westerberg thing, but they, there was an MTV show that was just for him or for them that didn't go well, you know? And, you know, when MTV is the biggest radio station, you need to just to find a way to kind of corral a bit of your energy, just a little bit. You just need to play the game Sit or... Sit there for two hours and suck yeah, it up. Yeah, just, you know, tell the stories. What, what do they want to hear? People want to want to know about the band they want to get a little inside glimpse and you have to kind of go along with that what you're selling and look look the bottom line is i tell every band i work with is like we're selling emotion that's all we're doing and if we could just tap from your brain to their brain you just do it but but that's why people sculpt and that's why they dance and make music and make write films. books and make films it's just you're trying to get out emotions and sometimes you're trying to get out things that you just can't talk about and so when you find a fan that wants to know more about it, whether that fan happens to be MTV or some guy or gal at a show, you have to decide when, if you want to do it. And that's one of the things I'm, you know, I mean, this is going to go off the, the chart a bit, but, but Metallica, as much as those guys were a bunch of ne'er-do-wells and I hung out with them in the Faith No More era and they drank and they were, their whole thing was, it's for the kids. And after they played their long show, they would sit around for two or three hours at the venue and you know, if kids somehow found a way to filter in backstage, they would sit there and talk to the ki to the kids, the fans. And that's look, Metallica aren't the best metal band, but they knew how to play the game. They knew that they were fans once. Yeah. And there were places I think they forgot that. They forgot they were fans once. And if they could have hung out with the Stones or hung out with the Faces or whomever, they, you know, what a thrill that would have been to just be in that space and in their 
breathe that same air would have been a thrill, mm -hmm. you know. And I think the replacements, if they could have just done a little bit of that, knowing that, you know, they, they got into a band because they loved, you know, the Beatles and the Stones. And, and I think Metallica did it right, you know. And they still raise a lot of hell. They still drink a hell of a lot of booze, you know. They did, but they but they still managed to maintain this thing. You know? Yeah, it's still ultimately your hope. I mean, look, I, I I'm an indie filmmaker. I've always I, I raise my own money. I do everything myself, so I don't have to answer somebody else. But right. still, in the long run, I would like people to watch my movies. Right. You know, I mean, in the long run, I mean, it's like I make movies. Where I I try to make them as that I'm very happy with them. But hopefully, you still want to find right. an audience for them because otherwise, you're gonna I'm gonna be serving coffee or working in a bookshop. Right. Which. You know, <laughs> yeah, but you that's know. that. I, I agree. That's the whole contradiction and the and the the difficulty in artistic sensibility and commercial sensibility, and where you personally draw that line and what you're willing to do mm -hmm. to get to where you want to go. And you're right, as a as a filmmaker, same thing. You can decide to make a very splashy, you know, more surface movie because it might get more people's attention, or you just follow your muse and do what's essential to you. And yeah, you have to find the line because you can't make. You can't just make films about your navel, but you have to find that place yeah. that feels right for you, you know, and that's fantastic. And I think those guys, I, I just wish they would have... I, I, I'm also not, I have five books out, and yeah. when I remember one book signing, yeah. I did a reading, and someone said, you know, what's your inspiration? And I said, pay my mortgage. This is my job. <laughs> I get up every day and I write. Right. And I want to tell a story, but ultimately <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I, I yeah. want to be able to do this. I mean, you still need that, you know... Right. And how cool though, if you, if you really get it right, how cool to pay for your mortgage yes. doing art. Yeah, to yeah. me, life doesn't get any better than that. I mean, yeah, it really doesn't. when I started as a producer, I had no idea, I, I was an engineer, I had no idea what a producer was, I didn't, didn't know what he or she did, I didn't know how they were compensated, it didn't even enter my head. I just love music, I love working with bands. And and so the fact that I can you know, have a studio and uh, feed my family and pay our health yeah. insurance and Go on vacation because of working with bands is just. You're right. It's, 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 it's living the dream. It's it living is the living dream. the dream. You know? and, and you know, some days I mean, I, you know, I would never tell the artist. Like some days I do it for free because I just love it. Mm -hmm. And some days, literally a million dollars isn't enough. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> trust me, it's exactly the same. I mean, you know, just, you know, just like, at, no matter what you're doing, there are times when you just want to beat your head against the wall. Oh there are times God. when it's just like. You start at seven in the morning, and all of a sudden it's seven at night, and it's like, where the hell did they go? Yeah. I just had like, it just was, yeah. it was like smooth and perfect. Yeah, it's terrific. So, yeah. Yeah, just real right. quick though, because I mean, I mean this will probably, <clears throat> I, I, this, the movie ends at Grand Park when they break up. Mm -hmm. um, it, but I, I do want to put, I'm putting tons of extras because there's so many things, and I'm sure people would want to hear. But just how did you get to the, the Paul's first album? And good question. Uh, you know what? I think that. Um, I really wanted to do All Shook Down. Mm -hmm. After I'd done that first, you know, uh, not the first one. You wanted to come know. back for more. Uh, <laughs> I, well, you know what? It was, it was like, actually, there's a period of a, a year or two, and I was still friends with the band. I went out there, yeah, I wanted to come back for more. I mean, initially, I didn't want to come back for more, but I think I got to a place where I was more confident as a producer, and I think I knew the band. I knew how to get the best out of them. What did you done after them that made you more confident? Just real quick, just someone else. Uh, basically, the, I finished Don't Tell a Soul, and a week later, I was doing Faith the Moors, the real thing, which was had epic and was a huge breakthrough. Right. And then I did a bunch of records after that, but that was like the thing that was like boom, that put me on the map. Okay. Um, uh, around, you know, around the same time as the replacements, but it, but in a much bigger way. I mean that that. So I mean, I just I just was more confident, and I knew the band. And you know, I mean, the whole the whole don't tell a soul thing can be summed up with basically very difficult record. You know, being threatened night and day. But when I drive Paul and Slim to the airport. You know, Paul shakes hands and says goodbye, friend, and that just you know erases two months of of of, of torture. Yeah. So anyway, so okay, so I'm friends with Paul. I go out to Minneapolis. I meet with the guys. I, I give. I bring some you know distort you know some paddles, reverb, and stuff like that. And I talk to Chris. I meet with them and give them some stuff. And I hope that you know I, I get to do the next record. Well, it didn't happen. Um, and they work with Scott Lip. And then after that, I think Paul was going to do the solo record and. Uh, I think, I know he's gone into print saying this, or maybe on video, that he just liked me as a producer. He thought I was like the right guy for working with him. So I guess, I think he just, is he either here or him or Michael Hill called me up and said, do you, want to, do you want to work with Paul again? You know, and uh, I said, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I, you know, I was a big fan of his music, so. Who was the band at that point? Was Minahan in the band from the neighborhood? I know he was on that tour. You know what? I can't tell you. Okay. And, the, reas and the reason is this. I'm, 
I met with Paul and, and he had already put together a band. And we had like a couple days of rehearsal and we recorded for one day and he fired everybody. Ah, okay. He fired the entire band. Uh, maybe it may have been two days. I think it was two days. He fired Susan Rogers, the engineer, and he fired the entire band. And they had just done that song, Knocking on Mine, mm -hmm. which Paul thought that they nailed and it was really great. And they got this, you know, we, we, we cut it like the, like the faces. I mean, we recorded it as soon as it was done recording. You got a microphone up, we had a monitor wedge, we did backgrounds around the wedge, it had this great energy. He loved it and literally everybody was gone. Yeah. And it was down to Paul and I again. And I, you know, I produced, I engineered, I actually ended up playing some stuff on that record. And, uh, and so I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, that record, I, that record, I think, probably had the sound you wanted. Yeah. For Don't tell Soul because the record has a great sound, and there's, some yeah. really, and there's also, but there's also some really beautiful intimate moment. What's the one? That, uh, there wasn't the one recorded in a bathroom. The really yeah. short one. Even here we, here are. we are. Yeah. I mean, that is a gorgeous little snippet. Isn't of that song. great? Well, I think the reason why I was working with Paul that time around is because he knew that I would do whatever it took to get the record right. Mm -hmm. And when I went out there, I had my guitar trunk of crud. I had some guitars and some amps and stuff like that. But I brought along a Fostex X15 four track. Oh, it is. OK, let's just, let me just pull and pop it. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I like, I, I'm one of those people who just like, but yeah. it retains it. So. Yeah, I mean, and, and I know a lot, because we are we already have a lot of ideas about how we're oh. editing stuff, you right. know? And because we're going from beginning to end. Nice. Um, you know, but then breaking it up with little things like right. a quick, like, minute and a half of everything Bob wore on stage. And, like, bang, 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 bang. And a couple of, like, really sad stories. Well, sad, in a, not in a way, but uber fans, like, you know, at 15 years old, was like the depressed kid who probably was going to slit his wrist and the replacement saved her life. And we have a couple of really, really good, like, really yeah. touching stories on that. Are we, are we Okay, you know, and um, you know, and then yeah. uh, what the oddest covers they did, you know, and yeah. and, and and really, we, I mean, it, 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 but and we also have like some like we have um, uh, Mark Treehouse who was working at Orfolk, and then bought it, bought it and became mm -hmm. Treehouse Records, mm -hmm. and who was an alcoholic at the time, and he to and he's been sober for twenty five years, and he talks about. What, how true Here Comes a Regular was for someone who was at the CC Club, which is now over his shoulder through the window. I mean, we have some right. really yeah. beautiful things like that. <clears throat> yeah. You know, um, yeah, it's just, but it's going to be cutting it down to let, make it not be eight hours long is the problem. <laughs> That's going to be a challenge. Yeah, so. Um, okay, so, so, we're about, so back to, yeah, so Paul's soul record, 14 songs. We're out in New York. Uh, you know, basically, he literally fired the band after two days. And, um, and so I brought all this stuff with me. I had the, and I had this Fostex X15 four track on a cassette. And I just knew, and I had all kinds of weird stuff that I brought that didn't make sense to bring on a recording session. But I was trying to kind of get in Paul's head and be ready for anything. And, and I think it was a lesson I learned working with them was that that it, it was what you recorded was more important than how you recorded it. Mm -hmm. And just to be ready. And so I was open to the experience this time. And so I had this four track and I went to the bathroom went to the bathroom to go pee and Paul's in there playing this twelve string playing this song. And and I go, Wow, that's really beautiful, you know? And uh, so I, 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 I leave and I go grab my Fostex, plug in a microphone <clears throat> and put put in a cassette and just walk in the room and I just put record and I go, you know, haul if you need anything. And just left the room and had a pair of headphones because I knew that that was a great song. I knew we could get something wonderful, but I knew that if we stop and got proper setup in the studio, that's the death of any creati creativity for Paul. And and so we did that and we got it. And then I ultimately ended up, uh, I think I transferred to 24 track and like added a bass to it or something like that. And we mixed it. Um, that's even here we are. Yeah, even here we are. Yeah. And but it was really interesting because he mentions a blind girl in New York. It was really weird because he and I would go to the studio different ways. I, I would always walk and he went know this other way. And we both saw the same blind girl, but we never talked about it. This guy girl guy was walking through, you know, and, and on her own. So here she's in New York with this cane going through New York. And so he wrote that song and he and he sang that part. I go, I go, is this about the the gal in New York, or is this from? He goes, no, this, I go, and so we both had seen the same thing, and I was just on this, I was on the wavelength of what he was trying to do. So I knew that if I threw that in there, I'd get it, and that that applied to. I mean, there's a song called um, "Something Is Me." You know, again, he fired the whole band. That's me on drums, you know, and it was just the kind of thing like, well, there, we got a studio, we we don't have an engineer, we don't have a band, 
but we're gonna make a record. Yeah. And and I and I also like one night that song "Runaway Wind." Um, I was up late after we'd worked during the day, and I was just listening to the song, listening to the lyrics. I listened to it like probably like twenty times, and I really got inside the skin of that song. I really started to understand what it was about. And I, I ended up calling Paul. I go, "Is this song, you know, about you know your dad and this, this, and that, and blah, blah blah?" We were talking, and then at the end, I go, "I go, I think it's about your dad, but I really think it's about you, actually." You know, and it, it was just one of these things where I think he was surprised because. I cared enough to listen yeah. and to understand it, not to, to say I'm going to change it, but just to really understand what he was trying to do. Mm-hmm. And I think that he knew that I was, I had his back and I was there and I would do whatever it took to get a great record. And also that song, uh, Black Eyed Susan, mm-hmm. which was, on, which song, was yeah. he had done that on his four track in his kitchen, yeah. you know, sonically just horrific, you know, just... Um, and you know we ch- and I go well. Can we re-record it? And if, unfortunately, he had put the guitar in a weird tuning, and also the guitar wasn't even in standard A440, so we couldn't even find the tuning. I don't think we'd ever got we'd get that vibe back. And I just said we should just put on the record the way it is. And he looked at me like I was crazy because you know as a engineer, producer, professional guy, that's anathema to put on a four track that was recorded by him in his kitchen. But those are know. the things that like that I think that made the, it it made it more like a replacement record. Than yes. Yes. Exactly, and so and so I said we should just put it on the way it is. And he looked at me like, "Are you really saying this?" I said, "I think we should put it on the way it is. We're not going to beat this. It's a great song, and I think we should do that." Yeah. And I think he realized that he made the right decision because I was willing to go the distance. And we did at the time. This is when they had this real kind of the beginning of digital technology where they could try to clean up some of the hiss and noise. And we, you know, paid a chunk of money to this guy to see if he could process it and get rid of the hiss. And I tried to mix it again, and you know we just never beat the original. And so, for me, those moments where you know whether it's using the demo that he did in his kitchen, or a, a four track that was done in the bathroom at you know the studio where you could hear the rumble of the air conditioner, it was like I mean it's there, you know, and we couldn't you can't get rid of it, you know, or me playing really you know rhythmically challenged drums on that record. I mean a lot of things. I just I think he knew that. I was kind of the yin to his yang. I knew I could, I could capture technically what he was trying to do, and um, that was, and so that was part of the learning process of me working with him on, don't tell a soul. What year was that? Was that like '92 ish? I think it was. Yeah, okay. I think it was '92. Right. And you said you set up a studio. Was that, was this like what he eventually went, would go to record like stereo mono on? And yeah. Well, ac- actually, yeah. It, it it was initially a um, 16 track digital system. I put it all together, made it really boneheadedly simple, and he in, used it for a lot of those early recordings. And it got to a point where I would, you know, I talked to him, hey, how's it going, you know? And then eventually, one of the eight track ADATs died. So then he just had one eight track ADAT. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know, I can zip out there, we can fix it or get you a new. And he goes, nah, I'm kind of gotten used to working with eight tracks now. And so, yeah, I think a lot of that stuff was done on eight tracks. Mono was the one that was the other solo record I thought that was just yeah. that. The replacements fine. Yeah, you know, but again, yeah. I mean, there are songs that just stop, like they run out of tape, which is probably exactly. Oh, that's Paul. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a song called uh, "Men Without Ties" that was supposed to be on his solo record, mm-hmm. and you know, I forgot. I mean, the chorus is basically like "Men Without Ties," as in "Men Without Ties" who don't wear business suits, yeah. but also "Men Without there's Ties." A good, it's a good tune. Actually. Yeah, you've heard yeah. it. Oh, I've heard it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When he did that thing, we, we were doing his solo record, and, and I, I heard his demo. I go, you hear all these like singing in the background. And I'm like, like, oh, that's cool. You did that demo at your house. You like get some buddies down to the basement to like sing some backgrounds and uh-huh. have a fun time. And he's like, uh, he's like, no, that's actually all me. You know, and yeah. I, and I dawned on me how much of a. He's really reclusive. His his natural temperament is really to be more, right. kind of quiet, and he's a homebody. I think. And there's a part of him, of course, that like, likes to go out there and rock out mm-hmm. the replacements. But did you have anything to do with the the, <coughs> the, the two other songs that came out when they did the best of? Uh, which ones were? Th- uh, no, that was Ed Ackerson. Oh, okay, Probably, yeah. all right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I did do. I I worked with Paul on a uh, m- oh a Melrose Place thing. Uh, I those remember those, it was yeah, one song on Melrose Place. Yeah, okay. uh, a Star's yeah. Board, I think. Yes. And yes, yes. and we did that at his house with that system I put together mm-hmm. for him. Um, I so I did that. that yeah. Thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, we've been around the block. Gotcha. And we've known each other for a long time. We, and we're, I think we're two weeks apart in age. So, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it's because uh, <laughs> it, I mean, it, the solo stuff, it's like, like I said, I mean, love the first one. I mean, Sue Kane, no, uh, Gratification, yeah. Or, yeah, love It's a Wonderful Lie, yeah, but yeah. I don't, I mean, I probably couldn't tell you one other song on that record, yeah, yeah, yeah that was that's the one he did with Don Was, I think, yes, which I yeah. don't, I, I, I don't see that, I personally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think that was a good parent. I think Paul was pretty because I met him when he was making that record, I met him at Ocean Way, and I, I could just tell it was not really. Yeah, a good pairing, and, and then he did one other on Capital, and that was the end for Capital. I don't yeah. know, again, I can't even think yeah. what the title was. I can picture the cover, but yeah, I can't, yeah. A w one quick story about the um, everything kind of coming full circle after we did fourteen songs, and I mean that just is a really cool sounding record. I had this old Vox amp that we used for most of the guitar parts. Ran into Don, Don was uh, you know, like I don't know, a couple of years after that, and they'd done I forget what Rolling Stones album it was. Uh, I don't know if it's Steel Wheels or something. Anyway, they did, and I didn't talk to him. He goes, he goes, uh. He goes, you know, we uh, we listen to 14 songs almost every day while making the Rolling Stones record. He goes, we love the vibe and the sound of that record. Nice. And and it's so cool because we were influenced by the Rolling Stones, yeah. made this record, and then that record really inspired them to kind of try to make something more true to who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, I, I, I love the, that mixture of the really lo-fi stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I think it's really... What was the single? The, the World Class Fat, which yeah. is just a, a fun rock song that... That was that yeah. was literally literally written and recorded in an hour, literally. Really? Yeah, Paul wrote it. I had my friend Josh freeze up to play drums. He wrote the thing down, boom, done. <clears throat> and wow. yeah, and that record, the, the, you know that song, Silver Naked Ladies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ba I basically had learned Gorilla recording, making that record with Paul, because I had set up this like really gorgeous Neumann microphone in the control. I had it on a boom right in front of the, the console and. Uh, and I and he recorded that track and uh, he was wondering why I would set this thing up, but, but he just done the track with the band. He was really excited. And I go, you want to do a vocal? And he was thinking I'd take him to a vocal booth, headphones. And I go, yeah. I swung the mic over the, the console, turned the monitors incredibly loud, and he grabbed that mic and did you know like two vocal takes. Now one, you shouldn't have a sensitive microphone with that much sound pressure with all the the monitors, and the fact that he's grabbing the thing is not good either. But you know it's a stunning vocal and it's the yeah. spirit of, of rock and roll and once i learned to try to try to maintain like a a step in front of paul or even just in step with him so i knew like when he was going to feel inspired just to try to catch it you know what i mean and 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 instead of like okay now let's go to the booth let's put these headphones right. on let's do this and that well it sounded like is is as <clears throat> difficult a, a process as don't tell a soul was it prepared you for your career yeah, it, did. <laughs> it was like boot camp, wasn't it? It was like boot camp. Yeah, I, yeah, that's yeah, that's one of the more difficult records. Yeah, it was probably for me the most difficult record. It's the one that I look back and like, oh my god, I mean, it was just just personality wise and just trying to get through it. And you know, if I had like, you know, if I had a, if I was more established, I had an engineer that I usually worked mm -hmm. with. There'd be like two of us, and I could you know we could kind of buffer it, or he could kind of cover the bases, and I could deal the emotional, you know, whatever parts yeah. of making the record, and he'd take care of the technical stuff. But I was just, like, technical stuff, you know, dealing with the band. And, and, I, and you know, nowadays I've got engineers, so I can, like, you know, I've got someone who can help out. That, that record was just really trial by fire. You know, and even doing engineering production for, for Faith No More wasn't, you know, wasn't like working in their places. I mean, you know, they all wanted to kind of be there. They wanted to make a record. They were, you know, we were kind of, I always felt like I was always pulling together with, uh, with bands, with other records. Like, we're all pulling the sled together in the right. same direction. Replacement was just like, you know, four marbles rolling down a hill. I'm trying to like kind of corral them and try to get them into a shape that would be presentable, you know. And w was there ever any, I mean, did any of them ever go missing? Or, I mean, I, 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 we've heard stories of Tommy just disappearing for days. He didn't disappear. I mean, he, he yeah, uh, yeah, he didn't disappear, but he splintered a gorgeous Gibson Firebird bass. I mean, he just, I mean, not broke it, but just, splintered it in the middle of tracking and I'd made the mistake of because I was very new to working with with bands on major labels and mm -hmm. so we had these things called per diems you know and each guy got 35 bucks a day for per diem so I thought well instead of giving him 35 bucks every day you know just give him like whatever 100 and something I'd pay him for the week you know yeah. and oh what a mistake that was because I mean after Tommy splintered the bass this is typical replacements Tommy splintered his bass so Paul pulls a hundred dollar bills and just starts letting him on fire you know which is that whole thing well one guy's just ruined his thing so I'm gonna start ruining this you know or I'd give him this, you know, pretty diems, and you know, I'd give him like, you know, 150 bucks, and the next day, like, empty pockets. Like, what do you mean empty pockets? Well, we went up to the bar, and blah, 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 and we need money. I go, I, I don't have any more. That's it, you know. So then I had to start giving him money on a daily basis, you know. And then, of course, they'd order out alcohol, and I have to 
hide it and they literally literally after a while they like if you're hiding that alcohol we're gonna kick your ass you know where's that alcohol where's the booze you know so it was it was not good it really wasn't a great record at the end and and I, i'm i'm dear friends with paul and you know I've, yeah. tommy and i i've talked to him a lot but i mean they're they're good guys you know i just uh I mean, we're, we're at that point where you're like thinking, it's like I should listen to my dad and become an accountant or a lawyer or whatever it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought I, th I thought about it. Well, I just I just knew I didn't want to work with them. Actually, after making the Faith the More record, I thought it sounded so horrible. I called my mom and talked about getting into real estate because just and it, it, it was the breakthrough. Record. It was the breakthrough record, but it just sounded so bad. It sounded so bad on my car stereo. It sounded really bad on my home stereo. But on MTV and on radio, it sounded amazing. Would, I mean, would you do something? Did you do any of that? With, I mean, because I, I, I know whenever, like, um, I'll, I'll even, like, when I do a movie, when I do a mix down and stuff, I will take it, I will watch it on my iPod, I yeah. will watch it on the cheapest TV and baby. Right. I mean, you watch it everywhere because yeah. it sounds different. Yeah. yeah. Did you do that with the band? I did. put it in the. Cassette? Yeah, I do all that stuff, but it just, you know what? What about the replacements, though? Did they care about what it, like, what it would sound like in the car on the drive back? Um, I yeah, I tell. think so. I think they were, do, yeah, we're doing that. Yeah, yeah, okay. we're doing all that stuff. I mean, I mean, the, the thing was that, that by that point in time, I became kind of like part of the group, to, you know, part of the pack with, with Paul and Slim. And it was us against you know, Chris Lord Algae, you know, at that point in time. Then he was more the outsider. And we were trying to like, you know, hey, can we you know, make it sound more like this and that? And <laughs> gotcha. But, yeah, I mean, great record. Yeah. Uh, just tough. <laughs> yeah, I've never had a record that – I mean, I've had difficult records, but that was just – I mean, I've had records where guys go AWOL – on you know crack or heroin i've done all that stuff i've done but but the replacements i just never had th that thing i just felt like you know i was just like mm -hmm. you know in just your career what's your what are your like two or three favorite records you've ever done mm, good question well i have to say maroon five because it was for, first of all it was it was a it was i made the record at a time that that kind of music wasn't on the radio and everyone thought i was crazy and i, I made a it was my biggest long shot in my career uh, they're a band that people said, oh, it sounds like Jamiroquai, why are you doing this band? And they're on uh, uh, a record label that had never put out a record. They're on Octone. There was a, they were the first band. So everything was stacked against me with that mm -hmm. record. I was offered another gig at twice the money, and I, I still worked with Maroon 5 and you know, sold 12 million worldwide. So that was pretty good. Yep. So that was nice. Uh, so, I mean, that, I mean, that was, I mean, I like the ones that are, I'm kind of going against the grain and trying mm -hmm. to, you know, and same thing with Faith, the Faith the More uh, record. We made it for Slash Records, and it was a, uh, uh, upstream to Warner Brothers, and I, if I had a dollar for every time Warner Brothers said, "Love the record, great songs," it's never going to get on radio, and went to number eight. I mean, because the band toured their behinds off, and they it was a song that was, you know, rap metal had never been on the radio until that time, and then that that kind of broke the doors yeah, open. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I like those kind of stories where you make records that aren't supposed to be made. I'm kind of a left of center guy, even though I love pop. I, I